Now that we understand how the model of aggregate supply and aggregate demand can be used to model short-term business cycle fluctuations, we can start to talk about how the government acts to minimize business cycle fluctuations. So remember, our economy grows at some long-run growth rate around 2 to 3 percent. But around that long-run growth rate, the economy fluctuates, sometimes growing very, very quickly and sometimes contracting. And those short-term business cycle fluctuations are costly because people lose their jobs in economic contraction, it increases inequalities, makes us unsure about what to expect economic conditions to be over time. So the government aims to reduce business cycle fluctuations, meaning that they would like to boost the economy during times of recession, but also that they would like to slow the economy to decrease economic growth during a rapid expansion. So we're going to talk about two different sets of policy options that are available to us to address uh, business cycle fluctuations. We'll talk about fiscal policy, the government budget, that's taxation and spending, and then we'll also talk about monetary policy, which we've already talked quite a lot about in terms of how the Fed controls money supply. So we're gonna start with monetary policy because you guys already have a pretty solid background with monetary policy. We'll cover that in this video, and then the next video will focus on fiscal policy. So, um, in general, in order to counteract the business cycle, the government will adopt policy to push in the opposite direction as the economy is heading, right? So, if the economy is contracting, shrinking, like now, we are going to adopt an expansionary policy. We're gonna to try to expand the economy to counteract the business cycle fluctuation. So expansionary policy would occur during um, an economic contraction. And what we would be trying to do is to expand or increase typically aggregate demand. And now I'm talking specifically about expansions and contractions driven by aggregate demand shocks. So this is why it was useful for us to understand the different types of fluctuations caused by shocks to long run aggregate supply, shocks to aggregate demand, and shocks to short run aggregate supply. If we have a shock to long run aggregate supply, then we need to address the underlying problem, right, in order to increase once again our long run potential output. If we have a shock to aggregate demand, we simply need to boost aggregate demand to return already to our normal level of potential output. All right, so expansionary monetary or fiscal policy would mean increasing aggregate demand and that would be appropriate during an economic contraction or recession um, like the one we're having right now. But likewise, contractionary policy is important to cool rapid economic growth during expansions. Because we think that if the economy is growing too quickly, say we're growing at five or 7% per year, we know that's higher than what's sustainable in the long run. Right? In the long run, over the last 100 years, our economy has grown at an average of two to 3%. So if we're growing too quickly, we know we gotta come down again. And when the economy starts to come down again, then that could contribute to another recession, right? So we would like to smooth out by both boosting during recessions and cooling, right? Decreasing growth during expansions. So contractionary, either monetary or fiscal policy, would aim to decrease aggregate demand, which would be appropriate during times of economic expansion. All right, so now let's talk specifically about monetary policy. Monetary policy is control of the money supply. You know that already, we've talked about that already. And 
you know already the tools that the Fed has available to them in order to uh, change money supply, to try to impact the value of money, perhaps the inflation rate, and interest rates. So with the Fed often targets low interest rates or higher interest rates uh, and announces those targets for the federal funds rate um, in order to signal the type of monetary policy that they are adopting. Here, instead of having the y-axis as the value of money or the price level, I've simply replaced it with the interest rate, which gives us a shortcut to understanding how money supply will affect aggregate demand. So let's go through an example of what expansionary monetary policy would look like. And remember, this aims to boost economic growth or boost aggregate demand during a time of economic contraction or recessions. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, remember, aggregate demand is made up of spending, spending by consumers, businesses, the government, and people in other countries. So in order to boost aggregate demand, we want to encourage more spending. And to do that, the Fed is going to increase money supply in order to decrease the interest rate. So we have an increase in money supply leading to a decrease in the value of money and a decrease in the interest rate. This could result in inflation, but that is uh, during a recession Right, something that we're willing to take on. You saw in the video about sticky prices that actually having some upward, uh, sorry, sticky wages, that actually having some upward price mobility, having some inflation during a recession could allow employers, right, to take those wage decreases in real terms without decreasing wages in nominal terms, right? So we're less worried about inflation during a recession more worried about inflation during an expansion. Um, all right, so we've got this decrease in interest rates, which is going to, wait, remember back to your loanable funds market, a decrease in interest rates is going to encourage borrowing, right? encourages borrowing and spending, okay? Because if you're thinking about either you got some money, you wanna spend it or save it, well, if the interest rate is really high, you have a bigger incentive to save your money. If the interest rate is lower, you have less of an incentive to save your money and you might just spend it today, right? The lower interest rate is going to encourage borrowing and spending and discourage saving. Right, so if the interest rate is low, consumers are gonna be more likely to spend their money instead of save it. That's gonna increase C, right? Consumer spending. Businesses are gonna be able to get loans more cheaply. Um, so that's going to encourage investment spending great. Um, and so that's going to shift out aggregate demand, right? Aggregate demand will increase as we have increases in both consumption and investment spending. Yeah. That lead to this increase in aggregate demand. And that helps to counteract a recession that was driven by 
a negative shock to aggregate demand. Contractionary monetary policy works in exactly the opposite way, right? So in times of rapid economic expansion, we need to cool down growth. When you say slow down, we want more slow, steady growth. So we need to decrease money supply, leading to an increase in the interest rate, giving people more of an incentive to save their money rather than spend it, right? And cool down investment by making borrowing money more expensive. So this encourages savings and discourages borrowing and spending. Decreasing consumption and investment and leading to a decrease in aggregate demand. That would be appropriate, again, in times of expansion driven by a positive aggregate demand shock. Okay. So the government is moving counter to the business cycle. Here, using money supply in order to impact the value of money and the interest rates in order to smooth business cycle fluctuations to maintain a hopefully more slow and steady growth rate. In the current crisis, the Fed has adopted an expansionary monetary policy by cutting their target for the federal funds interest rate to zero. It's basically as slow as interest rates can go, although some European countries have adopted negative nominal interest rates. Monetary policy cannot solve our current crisis because it is driven primarily by a public health crisis and shocks to long run aggregate supply. However, the Fed increasing liquidity in markets through both quantitative easing and the decrease in interest rate allows markets to continue to function in times of crisis hopefully preventing a financial crisis in addition to the health and economic crises that we're already facing. Next, I'm gonna have you watch three videos from Marginal Revolution about fiscal policy, and then we'll come back together for a quick goodbye and a talk about coronavirus.